The next section is on those more devastating injuries, the pilon, the talus. As you know, the distal end of the shin bone continues to confound physicians and be a challenge in their repair. And I would say over the last 23 years that I've been here, it seems that proportionally we're seeing more and more referrals for periarticular fractures, but particularly those that are difficult to uh, treat, the uh, Schatzker sixes and the pilons. So uh, the first presentation is from my valued partner, Sean Nork, on the state of the art. Sean. Thanks very much. We'll spend the next several minutes then talking about open reduction internal fixation of tibial pilon fractures, particularly looking at C-type injuries and complex articular fractures of the lower end of the tibia. I think this does represent the combined experience of about 20 years from this, from this institution particularly beginning with uh, Steve Benershka on down the line. I'm going to try to focus a little bit on the impact of the injury uh, on, the, on the predicted surgical approach as well as implant placement, and then look a lot at techniques of reduction as opposed to reviewing the literature on these injuries. So I think all tibial pilons that are C-type usually begin with these three articular fragments, and I think they're well described, and, and they typically are the result of a axial loading injury, and these fragments rotate based upon their ligamentous attachments away from the central axis. This produces some major fracture lines that typically occur, and these will help to predict the surgical approach that's necessary to address impaction that occurs along these typical lines. So everyone always desires a general fixation strategy for the treatment of P-line injuries. And I think this is a good approach if you're coming through an anterior surgical exposure just, just in general. I think the general strategy is to fix to the posterior lateral segment. Now the problem is there's usually a dorsiflexion deformity of the posterior lateral segment. So the first reduction move is always to derotate the posterior lateral segment and hinge it on its posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. And then generally the reduction proceeds from the medial fragment to the posterior lateral fragment, then the reduction of the centrally impacted segments, finally reduction of the anterior lateral segment, and then confirm the reduction radiographically some type of fixation for the articular segment, and then whatever implants are then desired to span from the articular segment to the diaphysis. So typically this involves some type of temporary fixation followed by replacement with permanent hardware of the articular injury. And I'll go through several case examples to emphasize these points and some of the reduction maneuvers needed. This is obviously a very simple and straightforward three-part tibial pilon injury. But you can see, represented with the yellow arrow, the tension failure on the posterior aspect of the tibia, even in the subtle injury, and the dorsiflexion deformity in the articular step-off, represented by the red arrow. Now you can see at the time of reduction, and this is after an open reduction, and the articular cartilage looks to be congruent, but you see this persistent dorsiflexion deformity from the posterior segment. And unfortunately, so many tibial pilon malreductions begin with this first reduction move, which is to leave the posterolateral segment dorsiflex. So that means all the implants need to be taken out and then re-reduced, followed by placement of permanent hardware, once that dorsiflexion deformity has been corrected so you can build from the back of the joint to the front and to anatomically align it on the lateral view. And this is a picture from Dave Barre showing an osteotome, whatever one chooses to use, joysticks, uh, or some device to derotate the dorsiflexion deformity of the posterolateral segment as the first reduction move uh, so that there's a chance for an anatomic reduction of this injury. Now the fracture pattern is going to determine the optimal surgical approach combined with the associated soft tissue injury of the, of the lower extremity. Most C-type injuries are fixed through anterior exposures and I think there's value to both the anteromedial as well as the anterolateral exposure, but I think increasingly we're using secondary posterior approaches uh, on some injuries, especially to reestablish some type of a posterior column to the reduction. 
I think the intermedial exposure has been, been well described. I, I think just some of the technical aspects are the incision should really be over the anterior compartment and not over the tibia itself, avoiding the peritoneum of the tibialis anterior tendon, typically curving acutely at the joint and then creating this large anteromedial full thickness flap. This is a demonstration too of the view that can be obtained. You can certainly see into the joint has great, a great view of the medial shoulder of the joint where there's classically some, are, some impaction and allows for placement of both lateral implants that you can see here as well as medial buttressing implants for varus failure type pilons that need implants in those locations. I think this is a classic example of a varus failure pilon. You can see the tension failure on the fibula as well as the medial impaction on the CT scan with those classic articular segments right at the medial shoulder. I think these would be very difficult to access through any other surgical exposure. So this is an ideal fracture pattern for an anteromedial approach which was used. And this is after an anteromedial exposure, placement of a medial sided buttressing implant uh, as well as a lateral uh, non-locking implant for this particular patient. Now alternatively, an anterolateral exposure I think has been used increasingly just because it is such a soft tissue friendly approach for these injuries. It's an incision that's typically in line with the fourth metatarsal. It's not that extensile proximally, but distally it allows great access to the tailor neck. The superficial perineal nerve classically crosses that incision and needs to be protected throughout, but it does allow great exposure all the way through to the medial shoulder. And so this is an example in this patient of, a, of an anterolateral exposure. And this is after placement of a femoral distractor which gives plantar flexion and distraction to the joint so that one can view the back of the joint as well as all the way over to the medial aspect of the joint. The one thing it doesn't allow is for great access to the medial portion of the joint and for impaction injuries at the medial shoulder. But a separate small incision can be used then to place a medial buttressing implant even in fractures that are treated through an anterolateral exposure. So here's an injury. There is a rather medial exit point to this fracture, but it's a simple and straightforward three-part tibial pilon injury, as you can see. This patient had horrible medial soft tissue, so an anterolateral exposure was still used. And this is some of the intraoperative uh, radiographs demonstrating the reduction. Once again, just a sequential reduction from the posterolateral to the medial to the anterolateral segment, followed by placement of small fragment screws in order to stabilize this. And then once again, whatever implants are then chosen to span from the articular segment to the diaphysis to complete the reduction. I think just a few cases then to drive home some of the differences in these fracture patterns and what's important to look at with regards to surgical exposure and reduction sequence because I think those are some of the most challenging aspects of fixing pilon injuries. So in this 32-year-old gentleman who, who fell about 12 feet, he has a large open wound, and you can see this complex and comminuted pilon injury. The good news about this injury, despite the fact that there's significant articular comminution, I think is well demonstrated, there's an extremely large posterolateral segment. And so I think that decreases the complexity of these injuries because at least there's something to build to beginning from that, from that posterolateral segment. So one can work from the back to the front, derotating that, and then slowly piecing back together the intercalary articular segments and going through the same reduction maneuvers needed to put the joint back together, some type of fixation then to secure the articular fragments and then plates to secure the articular segment to the diaphysis of the tibia. This is that patient then at two years, there's certainly arthritic changes at the ankle joint, but I think the overall anatomy of the distal tibia is well maintained uh, thus far. I just want to mention some alternative strategies that can be useful, I think, in some complex tibial pilon injuries. As you can see, this patient who fell from a significant height, who has this horribly comminuted pilon fracture that's, in, that's incredibly hard to figure out where to even begin on something like this. So we certainly start with some type of spanning external fixation uh, for this injury, assuming that that's going to improve the overall reduction. Sadly, all it does is center the talus underneath the tibia, but it certainly doesn't help with the articular segments of this whatsoever. So there's some interesting findings in with the CT scan. I think there's a relatively small posterolateral segment, which makes this difficult. There's that large posteromedial articular fragment, 
that I think would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to fix through an anterior exposure because there would be nothing to build to. So I'd mentioned earlier that we're increasingly using posterior exposures as part of a staged process to fix difficult peline injuries, and I think this is a great pattern for that. I remember this case from several years ago, as though it were yesterday, I called Dave Beret and said, I think, we need to, I think we need to work on this one together, and he was good enough to come down. This one's so ugly, so we began really from the back, first reconstructing the cortical segment, and then working down to the articular segment so that would, there would be a stable pillar to fix to. And so once again, a post-remedial exposure, which allows wide access to the posterior aspect of the pilon, and then using some flexible fixations. So if the dorsiflexion deformity was not perfectly corrected, once we did an anterior exposure, we could still change that in the future. So you can see flexible implants that are strategically placed such that they don't impede on any future anterior exposures. And that's just a small two millimeter plate placed in the back that reconstructs that posterior pillar. And then two weeks later, come back and do an anterior exposure. And, that, and then this is this patient at about a year after this injury. So in summary, I think with tibial pilon fractures, I think open reduction is still necessary for the vast majority of these articular injuries. And I think we've come a long way with understanding both the injury patterns as well as the reduction techniques. The injury pattern really should determine the location of the surgical incisions as well as the optimal location of implants. I think you really need to understand multiple approaches to treat these, especially for fractures of increasing complexity. And I think open reduction really does allow for the best chance of an accurate joint reconstruction as well as restoration uh, of the mechanical axis of the lower extremity. Thanks very much. The next presentation is from Peter Cole, who uh, currently works for the University of Minnesota at Regents Hospital in St. Paul. And uh, Peter is hopefully going to help us understand when we need uh, to do an extensile or more open approach and when we might be able to treat these um, with less uh, soft tissue damage. Peter. Thank you, Brad. So this is my home, and I uh, want to say that I'm indebted to Mark Swinkowski for uh, recruiting me to the University of Minnesota to build a trauma program at Regents Hospital. So what is minimally invasive surgery? To me, it's a culture of thinking, and I think it's um, the desire to put as small a surgical footprint on the patient as possible. This was a 1997 green team pilon fracture that I did with Dr. Benershka, and we staged it as we have learned to do and planned our approach, and it was an anterior uh, approach, and uh, this gave us the window to uh, fix this, this, this fracture in a way that was novel at the time. I mean, this is a high metadiaphyseal extension fracture. Uh, this was 10 years ago, but it wasn't being uh, described up to that point. Uh, so that created the window for a submuscular sliding plate and ultimately restoration of length alignment, rotation, and articular reduction and stability. And so we wrote up that technique in the same year that uh, Helfit uh, and his group uh, did and uh, thus uh, was uh, perhaps uh, born minimally invasive uh, osteosynthesis or so-called uh, for the pilon. And I think the um, the goal, uh, the challenge is to uh, avoid this zone, uh, this so-called gator zone, which is uh, most often most severely threatened from a soft tissue standpoint, and the area where we have difficulty uh, trying to, to get uh, the skin closed, and m most often the area where we are requiring flaps. Now, in the past 10 years, there's been uh, probably about a dozen articles that have uh, been published that um, use the term minimally invasive or percutaneous or submuscular. And we still don't know about relative outcomes, although it seems like um, soft tissue complications are less. Uh, we don't know about uh, deformity and outcomes, though. So this is a very sort of new frontier, uh, really emerging on all fracture fronts, not just the pilon. So we just had a wonderful uh, talk on the windows of surgery. And like Sean, I would say that you have to be prepared to work circumferentially around the ankle. And you need to know your intervals. So the anterolateral approach uh, 
uh, which was nicely described. I'm simply going to do it through a smaller window. So this was a case I did uh, last week. You can see the uh, retinacular tissue and the distal part of the extensor digitorum. And you, you, that brings you right on to the anterior plafond where you get excellent visualization where you can book open the fracture and see the money. Now, if you want to work more medially, you do the same thing. And once again, we're just looking through smaller windows using the same approach. You typically have to resect some periarticular fat, and this is the interval between Tibant and EHL. And again, uh, you open up your window and um, witness the impaction, the comminution, the pathology. But as I teach minimally invasive osteosynthesis, I'm a little bit worried. I've studied hundreds of CT scans and done a lot of open surgery. And so I'm, I'm imagining this is Machu Picchu in Peru. And this is just an uh, unbelievable, one of the eight, eighth wonders of the world, uh, part of the Incan ruins. And you can imagine um, uh, having never seen Machu Picchu being enthralled with, with uh, uh, this construction and not really realizing what the rest of Machu Picchu looks like because you've never been there, you've never studied it. And you don't know that it's surrounded by towering mountains and at a very high elevation. And so that could be a problem when we're looking through small windows and I think that's something that we need to be very careful about and you have to somehow acquire that knowledge of the rest of the uh, landscape within the plafond. So through that window, you can accomplish, if you understand these things in the reduction techniques that were just described in the past lecture, to bone graft appropriately in the metaphysis, um, apply provisional fixation, um, address the anterolateral impaction, which is so uh, common, and then in this case, I've used an uh, anterolateral plate, the anti-varus uh, plate uh, uh, through the minimally invasive incision that Sean talked about and a respectful technique for soft tissue closure, as we have all learned, um, yielding uh, this ultimate fixation. I'm a fan of the posterior lateral window um, as well, and I fix every posterior malleolus fracture as well. Um, now, tricks uh, and evolving instrumentation that may help us to operate minimally invasively are starting to emerge, but for the last 10 years, we've been using conventional uh, instruments in an unconventional way. I think it's important to have passion for your surgical tray as I learned here and so uh, get familiar with all the things you can use through a small window because you're already compromised possibly by your approach so you have to be able to work through that window. I always use a headlamp I can't imagine uh, not doing so. You can see me here 10 years later with the the this, this same rims on my glasses as, as Dr. Benerska. I always use a femoral distractor. I can't imagine fixing a pilon fracture without it, but if you go to a, a fracture course with 60 or 70 residents in the room and you say, how many people here have used a femoral distractor? You may get three or four hands in that size of a group. I, I, I don't understand that. And this is the difference uh, between uh, when it is not applied and when it, it's applied. It opens up um, the landscape significantly. The periosteal surfer is a good tool to be able to create a tunnel without traumatizing the tissue. And um, so here is applied such a case and you can suture the uh, heavy braided suture and pull the plate right through in a, a, a single as atraumatic as possible uh, way to yield small approaches. Uh, here's the application of such a case. I would say about once every two years um, I have a pilon fracture and when I recognize all this speckled comminution, the subchondral fragments, I feel that it's going to be a waste of about 12 months uh, in this patient's life to try and reassemble uh, this. So through this approach uh, we took out um, these uh, articular pieces and I think the only person who can put this together is in the audience and not at the podium. And so um, I, uh, in this case, uh, filled the defect with uh, Rhea to um, execute a primary fusion. Plate holders are also, you can manipulate in multiple planes. 
Um, and this is helpful, a satellite screw which allows you to place a clamp on a bone so it's not constantly sliding off so that you're grinding the soft tissues. Um, this is a clamp extender uh, which I use. It's just a, a simple percutaneous screw that you can apply a Weber or a quad clamp to so that you're not crushing the uh, soft tissues. And um, whenever you're putting percutaneous screws in vulnerable zones, spread the soft tissues like is shown here. I think that in the name of minimally invasive, a lot of people are putting things in percutaneously, blindly. That's not a good idea. It only takes one painful neuroma to, to screw up the whole thing. I think fragment-specific fixation is something that I've kind of taken from my distal radius um, experience and applied it to certain pilon fractures. And um, so this is a 15-year-old with a triplane variant, but it was a little more complex. Uh, but I think studying the fracture planes and exit points, you can work through stab incisions and place uh, strategic uh, mini fragment plates in a patient who is otherwise going to heal uh, quite rapidly. And the pilon map, which was alluded to earlier, distinguishes three main fragments. And this is what we were doing uh, 11 years ago. This is Dr. Bonerska's hand, and we were contouring an anterolateral plate. So since then, we have a contoured plate for every part of uh, every bone. And I think it's really important to get to know these uh, implants because um, they fit on the bone one single way, and everyone's morphology is a little bit different, and it's a double-edged sword. And uh, this is uh, one that I um, particularly uh, was intrigued by because it addresses that anterolateral comminution. You saw in the last talk a lot of mini-fragment fixation, which is really not buttress, and I've done plenty of those cases myself. And this is a, a, a plate that I think will um, uh, address all the elements of that uh, pilon map, the fracture data that comes from that. So I think uh, things are happening in uh, the pilon world to bring us to a more minimally invasive mindset, which is a healthy culture, but I think we will also learn some hard lessons. I think the future will be characterized by better instrumentation. Um, uh, for um, this uh, less traditional surgery, uh, probably faster loading of fractures if we can do something to help the biology. Uh, diagnostic methods, which we're working on at our, at our own institution, to look at the integrity of cartilage after injury so that we might know something about prognosis. Better imaging so that we have more landscape in imaging rather than uh, very small keyholes to look at radiographs. And, Hopefully, we'll learn about the uh, relative um, outcomes of minimally invasive uh, pilon surgery. Thank you. Questions from the audience? So the, the terms uh, strategic and flexible get used a lot. And, you know, to some clinicians, uh, myself included, I understand strategic, but that can have a lot of different meanings. And I'd like both of you to address you know, what do you think the definition of strategic is? And then this flexible fixation that Sean mentioned is a good thing for later on when you want to correct little um, problems. But when does flexible fixation in the interim not be, when is it too flexible? When do, do you see failures of this? Or how do you make something be flexible yet stable enough to endure to the point where it doesn't have to be flexible anymore? Well, he addressed the flexibility issues. So, uh, um, so a strategic, you know, I think you have to always remember what you're trying to accomplish. And it sounds so rote to an audience like this, but uh, at the end of the case, you have to have restored anatomic reduction of the articular surface, length alignment, rotation, and stability, which to me means I can start to move the uh, joint immediately after surgery. So the strategy is how you get there and how, how you can affect um, uh, th those goals in um, uh, the shortest, uh, safest, most efficient uh, way possible with the highest likelihood of uh, success. So, you know, I think that involves um, um, an understanding about approaches, about reduction maneuvers, about implant choices, 
um, and about um, it, you know all the fundamental uh, preparatory work that goes into having our operating room ready uh, when the case begins. Thanks. Sean, do you want to address the first question about flexibility in addressing or changing or staging type C pylons and converting them in the first stage to type B pylons? Sure. And I think they're, they're, it's all related when you talk about being strategic. It's strategic yeah. with regards to the fracture pattern and strategic with implant placement. And then I think appreciating the primary mode of failure based upon what the injury radiographs look like. So is it a varus failure pylon or a valgus failure pylon? And then that's going to determine the size and location of the implant. And so you talked about flexibility of implants, and I'm, I favor non-locked, relatively flexible implants, but multiple points of fixation for most pylon injuries as opposed to making them too stiff. And so the problems that we typically see are patients who have either had a very stiff implant placed, in which case they get a metadaphs, metadaphsial non-union, or where they've used a single very flexible implant. So I think choosing the proper implant location is critical, and it's really based upon the injury radiographs, um, as well as using multiple implants as needed uh, if they're highly comminuted injuries. And then Brad mentioned using kind of strategic surgical procedures to convert C to B type pylons, which I think we're doing more and more, which is to use a separate approach then uh, to reconstruct a single column, typically somewhere either posterolaterally or posteromedially, as Peter kind of alluded to, uh, to reconstruct a portion of the articular surface. And then I think it allows for much more flexible fixation if you have a reconstructed column. One more question in terms of these, the patterns that both of you alluded to, where you have a, a posterior lateral and let's say a medial fragment, oftentimes with the initial displacement, there's soft tissue in a position, and I've encountered the posterior tib in that interval, which if it isn't uh, too displaced, you can often push out from the front, but many times you have to go posterior medially or posterior laterally to address that. Um, how do you, what's the best way of identifying those and what, when is it best to go posteriorly first in order to extract soft tissues? Because clearly with distraction, whether it's staged external fixation or interoperative um, femoral distractor, that tendon tightens and even uh, subluxes into the fracture site further. Right, so what Brad's talking about is with that displaced posteromedial segment, frequently you worry about entrapment of the postromedial tendons or the neurovascular bundle. And you can actually see it on a, you can see those structures on a CT scan. But I think the key is to look for them. I think that's what Brad's kind of suggesting is that it's very important to actually look for those structures in anticipation of which fracture patterns are going to be difficult from the front and to at least consider going posteromedially. And I believe one of our partners is currently uh, looking at a series of CT scans specifically to try and see how frequently uh, those structures are located within the fracture itself. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.